Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Digging Deeper Moment number 77. The mission of our Digging Deeper Moments is to take God's Word to God's world. We are so glad that you joined us. Last week, we saw that the world was created to be God's temple. That the Garden of Eden was planted as God's Holy of Holies, that Adam and Eve were God's image bearers and priests in His temple, and that they were to extend His rulership, His kingdom, and His blessing to the entire earth. Unfortunately, Adam and Eve blew their assignments in Genesis chapter 3, and immediately in Genesis chapter 4, we see humanity on a downward trajectory. In Genesis chapter 4, Cain kills his brother Abel, and Lamech, a descendant of Cain, introduces polygamy. In Genesis chapter 5, we are given the lineage of Noah, who we meet in Genesis 6. And in Genesis 6, it records that the world had become so corrupt by the time of Noah that God was going to start all over. Things got really really bad. So bad that the Bible says this in Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 through 8. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth that the daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth, in those days, the word giant is the Hebrew word Nephilim. And also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And so the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air, for I'm sorry that I've made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now verses 1 through 4 are some of the most debated in the entire Bible. The, the debate centers around three things, and Jonathan's going to put them on the screen for you. The identity of the sons of God who marry the daughters of men in verses 1 through 2 the identity of the Nephilim or giants in Genesis 6-4, and the interpretation of the phrases in those days and afterwards also in Genesis 6-4. Now over the next three to four weeks, I'm not sure how long it's going to take me, but we're going to unpack this and we're going to look at all, we're going to look at all three of these interpretations individually. But before we do this, we have to first look at how Genesis 6, 1 through 8 are arranged because this gives us insight into what Moses is really trying to tell us here. Whenever you study the Bible, you have to keep two things in the back of your mind, context and content. The content is what the Bible is saying, so you're trying to find out what it's saying, and the context is the background for what is said. And that's been a big focus here of our last couple Digging Deepers, maybe the eight or ten of them. We're trying to give you some background or context. One of the context or contextual issues we look for is what's called the literary structure, the way a writer in the Bible organizes the material that they're writing, because it says something about what they're trying to tell us. Moses organizes Genesis 6, 1 through 8 in what's called a chiastic structure. I've mentioned these before, but I'll repeat myself for those who may not have seen that lesson. A chiastic outline is an outline structure that repeats itself in reverse but when it does, it adds additional information. And so a chiasmus outline is A, B, C, C, B, A. And then you have to put together A and A. You have to put B and B together, C and C together, and then you'll finally come to understand what the writer is trying to tell us. Now, Genesis 6, 1 through 8 is arranged in the following chiastic order, which Jonathan, again, will put on the screen for you so you can see. First, letter A. This is the first point the writer makes in verses 1 through 2. He talks about the corruption of God's original blessing. Letter B, God's constraint upon humanity in chapter 6, verse 3. Moses' clarification. This is critical. He clarifies the Nephilim are not the problem in Genesis 6, 4. Then we have letter C again, because now it's going to begin to reverse itself, say the same thing in reverse order. So it left off in letter C, now it's repeating letter C. Moses' clarification, mankind's sin is the problem, Genesis 6-5. Then letter B, God's correction, what he's doing about the problem in Genesis 6, 6-7. And finally, letter A, God's covenant with Noah in Genesis 6-8. In Genesis 6, verse 1-2, 
we see an inversion of the blessing of God found in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, where God blessed Adam and Eve and told them to multiply and have dominion over the earth. Well, in Genesis 6, 1 through 2, we see that humans have certainly multiplied. But instead of having dominion over the earth, earth is having dominion over them. Something has gone wrong here. And we say this because, and I want to say this delicately, but because humanity is being dominated by sex. As we've seen in other Digging Deeper moments, it isn't gender and sexuality that make humanity the divine image bearers. It's not when people reproduce children that makes us in the image of God. Humans were created in the image and likeness of God as divine image bearers. And we saw in earlier lessons that our sexuality does not represent the nature of God. What our sexuality and gender represent is the natural part of us. It's, it's, it's when we were created as divine image bearers, we were also we were created in His image to represent the divine nature, spiritual nature, but we were also given a human body with the ability to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. In other words, our gender and sexuality are part of our humanity. We know this because in Genesis chapter 1, verse 22, God says to the fish in the sea and the birds in the air, He says, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. So God gives the same blessing to the fish and the birds. So the fish and birds are natural beings. They're part of the natural world order. And so our gender and our sexuality and our ability to reproduce, they speak of our humanity. Jesus says something very similar when He says in Matthew chapter 22, verse 30, when talking about the resurrection of the dead in the future, he says, For in the resurrection, those who get resurrected neither marry nor are given in marriage, which takes us right back to Genesis chapter 2 when God created Adam and then He created Eve and He brought Eve to Adam as His wife. He says, But are like the angels of God in heaven. So Jesus is juxtaposing the spiritual angels with the natural human beings. He says in the resurrection, we are going to become more like the angels. We're going to become more spiritual more like the spiritual than we are the natural. And I can't go any further than I don't want to press that too far. And so what we see throughout Scripture and all ancient cultures, what we see in history is that when people worship nature, that is when they became obsessed with life, when they become obsessed with life in this world now, when they focused on this world being all that there is, when that was what dominated their thinking, sex always dominates them. The culture becomes obsessed with sex. It's just, just read history, folks. You don't have to look hard. And eventually, this would lead to the collapse of civilization. This is documented well, in, documented well in history. And this is what Moses is showing us here. Instead of having dominion over the natural world, instead of fulfilling the mandate given to Adam to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and have dominion over it, they are multiplying, but yet they're being dominated by their natural instincts. They're being dominated by their humanness or their, or their natural instincts or inclinations. And it goes on in Genesis chapter 6, 3, we see that God had been striving with humanity. It says in verse 3 of chapter 6, it says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever. He is indeed flesh. He's natural. He's human. He's, he's worldly. Now, the word strive comes from the Hebrew word din, and it means to strive, contend, plead, or judge. In other words, God has been restraining man's natural instincts up to this point, but to no avail. Humanity has gone off the rails. Even though God has been striving with man during this period of time to not be driven by and dominated by the natural world, they are becoming dominated by it nonetheless. Now, when the Bible says that man's days, it goes on to say his days shall be 120 years, we can't be sure if he means man's lifespan will be 120 years. Some commentators take that perspective, or it will take 120 years for the, the ark that Noah is to build and the rest of the chapter will be built. We don't know which one to take. You, you pick, take your pick, which brings us to Genesis chapter 6, verse 4 in the Nephilim. And before we address those who the Nephilim are, 
we need to see that in both Genesis 6, 4 and 6, 5, Moses is making a very important clarification point, and it's this. In other words, this has to drive our discussion in the next few weeks. The problem Moses is stressing here, that what Moses is saying is the problem in the world at this time, hear me, church, is not the devil. It's not the demons. It's not the gods. The problem is in this world at this time is us. Folks, you read this context, you're going to see how many times, as I was reading this Genesis 1 through 8, just underline in your text how many times he talks about man. Man is the focus. Man's sin is the focus. He is stressing here, and through the rest of the chapter, we don't hear of any Nephilim. We don't hear of any more of what we get debating over on in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. None of that's in the rest of the chapter. The flood of Noah is going to come on the earth because of humanity's sin. It's not fallen angels. It's not demons. We'll get into all that over the next few weeks. But hear what Moses is saying. And what I believe is happening here as I've studied these verses, especially verse 4 and 5, is Moses actually clarifies what he's telling us here in those days and afterwards. And we're going to unpack those over the next three or four weeks. So we'll pick it up there in our next lesson. If this lesson helped you, please share it with a friend, like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, or better yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel. I hope to see you next week. God bless.